we can get the color. color. Well, we're gonna, we have the like name tag on there, with, but I think we can. Yeah. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. You got the hard part. Huh? You got the hard part. <laughs> no. <laughs> so is the mic on? Okay, I'm going to assume the mic is on. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to see you all here. This is my first program in person after what, a year and a half? Yes. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Beach Museum of Art. Tonight's program is a conversation between me, Eileen Wong, creator of this exhibition, Find Your Voice, and the exhibition's featured photographer, Doug Barrett, Thank who's you. standing next to me. For those of you who are watching this online, there is closed captioning available, and you can click the CC icon that is either at the bottom of your screen or at the top right corner. And this program is being recorded. The, uh, the recording will be available in about a week's time on the museum's YouTube channel, and a transcript will be available with the recording. For the benefit of the audience members who are primarily listening to this program, I will offer brief descriptions of what we are discussing. So we are standing in the Beach Museum of Art's Heil Gallery, surrounded by 13 black and white photographs in black frames. And they're all um, photographs that make up the exhibition, Doug Barrett, Find Your Voice. Doug is a documentary photographer, videographer, and photojournalist who owns 400 North Creative, a photography and video services agency based here in Manhattan. I am a woman of Chinese descent with medium length dark brown hair, and I'm wearing a white sleeveless top and navy blue pants. Standing next to me is Doug Barrett. And Doug, can you describe yourself in one sentence, please? I'm an African-American male with lots of hair, white shirt, black pants. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> now, before we begin, I would like to first acknowledge that K-State, as the first land-grant institu institution that was established under the 1862 Morrill Act, is historically home to many Native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized Native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kikubu Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many Native nations utilize the Western Plain of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others, such as the Delaware, were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. K-State and every university in the United States is on indigenous lands. The recognition that America's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential to this museum, which seeks to create decolonized spaces at the university and increase the presence, promotion, and support of indigenous and other traditionally marginalized faculty, staff, and students at K-State. Okay, Doug, I will start with a general question. Okay. For you, what is the power of photography? Oh, no. 
The power of photography to me is the ability to capture time, um, the ability to capture motion, the ability to tell a story. Um, all of these bodies of work, um, whether it was nationwide or whether it was local in my own backyard, um, allowed me to capture something to be able to share and tell a story to other people. Great. You have a lot of stories here. <laughs> so let's start with the one that's closest to home. Sure. And that's the Yuma Street <clears throat> Project here. Now, tell us, when did you start the Yuma Street Project? Uh, Yuma Street started in 2018. Um, it was a project that started from uh, a friend of mine who made, made a, a suggestion to me that after me making some comments that I wasn't familiar with the community, not being a Kansas native, that I should do my research because Yuma Street had a lot of history. Um, and from that moment in time in 2018, the summer of 2018, I reached out to a local friend who lived in the area and asked if I could use her driveway um, because I would be walking the streets um, to learn about the community. Um, it's kind of when it morphed into 2021. Wonderful. Now, I just want to point out, there's a quote up here on the wall. It says, what I've experienced only through history books you've lived through. And you wrote this. And it's a post for these two photographs that I want to zoom in on as examples of the Yuma Street uh, series. So we have Lazone Grace and Arlene Cole. Now, a uh, photograph of Lazone Grace, black and white, um, with a gentleman sitting in his screened in porch on a couch. And he's got a piece of paper, which looks like a certificate and uh, his rifle. And he's got a hat on that identifies him as a Korean War veteran, yeah? And then uh, below that is the portrait of Ms. Arlene Cole, and it's the same. She's sitting in her porch and uh, next to a table with, uh, with her things. And I, one of the details here I love is that there's a bug repellent <laughs> right there. So Le, can you tell us about La Zone Grace and Ms. Cole and why you conceived of this as a pair? Yeah, so uh, within the two years of working on the project, a good friend uh, who lives on Yuma Street told me that I needed to find Miss Cole and Mr. Grace. Um, she asked if I knew who they were. I told her that I was not familiar with who they were. Um, first was Lazone. She said Lazone is a 101 year old at the time, a uh, Korean War veteran that she believed also served in World War II. Uh, a little bit about Lazone, he was actually in the US Army during the time that the Army then became segregated and he received his first handshake from the first white officer that was in his unit. Um, he only wanted to fight, but because of the color of his skin, he couldn't serve other than in supply. Um, during that time, uh, he served 20 years and I asked him when I got this opportunity during the pandemic, uh, if I could make his photograph and three of his favorite things that his most treasured possessions was his hat, his 1903 rifle and his retirement certificate, which sits on his lap. Um, and Miss Cole, <clears throat> she actually was the longest one that took me to get in touch with her just because of her age during the pandemic. She wanted to be safe, but with so much history, I knew that the project could not wrap itself up until I had a conversation with her. But 94 years old, living on Yuma Street, she's seen it all. Um, and she afforded me this opportunity to sit with her. I think it was about half an hour. We had a conversation and she told me about coming from uh, the parts of Kansas that she came from until living in Kansas. So. Um, I know that you're working on a Yuma Street book, right? Um, can you tell us more about it? Yes. So within three years of work, uh, a little over 10,000 photos. Um, I've got to compile together all of the stories, the photos, put them into a book, and then hopefully uh, in collaboration with uh, some community partners, um, K-State Military Veterans Affairs, the Community Foundation who are supporting the book um, will allow me to put together something that I can share with the community and people about the story of Yuma Street. Dare I ask what's the status? Like when do you think it'll come out? <laughs> uh, I should have been completed by now, but again, culling through all of the photos, um, life, um, 
happens. And with that being said, I'm a little bit behind my deadline, but I hope to get it to the editor and designer within the next couple of months. So oh, excellent. Yeah, <laughs> I'm behind of my book too. So you're not the only one. <laughs> um, I will just point out that there are more uh, images here from the Yuma Street project. And this one is, um, I just pointed out a beautiful marriage with Mr. and Mrs. Gulliford. And I met Mr. Gulliford, uh, I think it was last week when he was here. So that was such a treat, you know, to see the real person that was in this photograph that, that I've looked at for a very long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I urge all of you to um, take a look, but for the, in the interest of time, let's move on sure. um, to the next series. But before we move on, is there a question from our audience here in the gallery that Doug can answer? I just want to preface, I love your work. Um, Thank you. Also, I, I was curious, it sounds like you were invited into this experience from a friend, mm -hmm. from not being a native Kansan yourself, and then you've done all this learning and exploration. What do you think is the biggest takeaway from this journey for you? What's the biggest thing you've learned or most notable? The biggest piece is that through my colleagues and I, you know, we were photographing last year during the pandemic for national publications. And one of the things that we were focused on was we need to be where the hot spots are within the civil unrest. And we kept forcing ourselves to try and be in those places, but logistically we could never make it there. And mainstream media was projecting what they wanted us to hear, both sides of the news. And one of the things we ended up focusing on was telling stories from our own backyard. And some of the same things that are happening in mainstream media are happening right here in Kansas, good and bad. So to be able to share stories that people can start conversations with from right here on Yuma Street in Manhattan, Kansas, in the United, middle of the United States, to me is pretty powerful that you, know, you can tell those stories right here. Question. Uh, could you discuss a little bit about Gordon Park's uh, inspiration, how he inspired you? Was it, it more in subject matter or photographic? a style of uh, that type of thing. Sure. The question was uh, how Gordon Parks inspires me, you know, just as an African American photographer, um, looking at the works that he created, and I believe it was Aileen who brought to my attention that, you know, some of the bodies of work that Gordon was doing, whether it was segregation, poverty and racism, you know, my homeless veteran project, uh, poverty, segregation of Yuma Street and the history of Yuma Street, into racism, things that were going on with the civil unrest kind of tied together, something I had never thought about, but you know, just being behind the camera, it's, it's about telling those stories. So I guess the same things he was doing 70 years ago, I'm still doing today. Doug is also an excellent golfer. <laughs> uh, as you go through the community and across the country, you see the good and the bad, the ugly of America. How do you process and manage that? I'm sure you have some great stories about great things from the people in our community. You probably heard some hard stories, some sad stories, and so on. So how do you manage that uh, to keep your professional focus and not, not let those emotions get in the way of hindering you? Sure. Uh, again, being a veteran, Dr. Lockett, you, you know that compartmentalizing work work-life balance, um, to be able to compartmentalize and process those emotions. You know, I would say that with the Homeless Veteran Project, after each state that I had completed, even though I would post the work on a Monday, it took me a week to get to that point because you're seeing people at their lowest. Um, you know, I'm not above anybody else. Uh, I could be there tomorrow, but, you know, to be able to reflect, hear the stories, capture the photograph, because again, once you take that photograph, then you have to relive that photograph after in the editing process. So, you know, then you have to put the words to go with the story. So it does take time. It does take healing almost in a sense to get through it. Um, and it is, it is something that takes time, but you know, you just have to compartmentalize and allow yourself to get through that time. <clears throat> and I'll just piggyback on what uh, Doug was said, you know, about <clears throat> writing you know, taking the time to write the words that go with the photographs. And so one thing that I found really remarkable is that, you know, he, he's an artist, not just with visual um, art, 
but also literary. You know, his his texts that go with the photographs, those are part of the artwork. It's a package. And that to me is remarkable. And that's why I wanted to organize an exhibition with Doug's work. So that's a good segue. So now we're going to move to that wall over there, which is the series Homeless Veteran Project. And Doug, you mentioned that you are a veteran. Can you just tell us a little bit what your experience is as a veteran and you know what inspired you to do this series? Yeah, so you know, being a veteran, you know, service, uh, service to your nation. Uh, we say the one percent. Uh, I never, I never looked at this project as starting as an actual project. It started with Leo and a conversation at an intersection, um, and I never thought that. Fast forward to 2021. Two days ago, I would be meeting with Major General Sims of Fort Riley discussing over breakfast this project or speaking to his command staff about this project. Um, and it means a lot to me because again, these are people that have sacrificed so much, um, but a lot of people have negative connotations about homeless. We all have probably experienced some homeless person or not, but when you actually sit down and you hear the stories of people across the United States, man and woman, uh, you realize that they're people as well. You know, I want to say that um, the photographs in this series um, show me something that underlines, you know, who Doug is, because these photographs are possible, to, possible because he stopped to talk to them. And, you know, I used to live in New York City, and there are so many homeless people, and people just walk by and don't pay attention. So to have this, these photographs here shows that Doug is someone with compassion and he will stop and talk to them. And that's really important. And when you stop to talk to them, then you get all these remarkable stories, you know, and uh, stories that debunk what may, people may think, you know, about who becomes homeless. So Doug, I would like you to choose a photograph among these three that we have on the wall to, um, to discuss in detail. So can you choose one and let's talk about it? Sure, let's just go with the middle, middle frame. The middle frame, okay. Mm -hmm. So with the middle, middle photograph, we have a, a man who is in shorts, you know, kind of dirty. He's wearing dirty boots and he's sitting on the concrete floor, right? And kind of against the concrete wall of a building. Yeah, so U.S. Army, or I'm sorry, U.S. Marine, he was actually a sniper. Um, he was wounded in his knee and he was shot in his right leg, still wearing his combat boots, living in Tampa, Florida. And this was interesting because this was in November of 2019, just before the pandemic started. And, you know, as you look at the two photographs, you'll see a man in Chicago in a coat. You'll see in New York City, you've got a husband and a wife in their full coats. And when I got to Florida, I was, it was 70 degrees and I was in shorts and in t-shirt and I was looking for what I had perceived as what a homeless person would look like. And not to come to find out that this was a homeless, homeless individual, but homelessness looks different in Florida because of the weather. Um, and his comment was, you know, we're trained to be invincible, but he lives in a cove and he, and he fishes in a cove where his homelessness uh, is about fishing and providing food for himself. So homelessness looks different in every state. Um, and I thought it was just very unique that uh, homelessness versus what I had been used to seeing in the Detroits and the Chicago's and New York's versus what I saw in a, a warmer climate state. So are you finding in doing this series that there are a lot of homeless veterans? Yes, yes. What's happening? Why are they homeless? They, they should be the ones who are taken care of, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot more political issues that, uh, that face this issue, but I think it's also a humanity issue. Um, but homelessness doesn't necessarily happen because they got out of their service. A lot of times people fall on unfortunate circumstances that lead to something, just like Leo's story. Leo had a life, he had a wife, he had a career, um, but due to those unfortunate circumstances, it led him to living on the streets. So, uh, you know, this husband and wife, I can't remember their full story, but I remember that they were actually waiting on housing, but this was everything that they owned in 
New York City sitting on the corner of uh, I forget what intersection it was, but this is Midtown New York, isn't Midtown, it? Midtown, yeah, yeah, I think it so. Looks I have to check the loop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, that's great. Um, I'd like to talk briefly about this mm -hmm. photograph because I think it's really fascinating. And I had a great conversation with our director, um, Linda Duke, about this, where she had a group come in and, you know, without telling them anything, she was asking them, well, what do you see? You know, what's the story here? And um, there were a lot of people, she mentioned to me, and this really stuck in my head, somebody said, oh, you know, they're sitting in front of a pile of trash. And, you know, but if you look closely, in fact, that's not a pile of trash. Those are all their belongings. You know, they don't have a home. And so they, they, they have to put their things in a shopping cart while they wait for temporary housing in the corner of the street. Yeah. You know, right here, one of the things she said she did is because of humiliation, she played crossword puzzles to distract her mind, because if she wasn't doing that, she would be constantly focusing on what people thought about her. And actually, when Luke and I were in downtown New York, you know, I was focused on the work that we were doing at the time, which was street photography, not even looking and paying mm -hmm. attention. But, you know, you run across this veteran and he listed a lot of his his credentials, which was he was with the second infantry division. Uh, a 91 Bravo, which is a combat medic. Mm -hmm. um, so again, he, he wanted to let everybody know his time and his service. Um, but again, it's just, it's unfortunate. I know. And to me, what was remarkable was that, you know, he really made it a point to write in his sign that he was a combat medic with an honorable discharge. Yeah. So, you know, that that's not what you might think like a homeless person should be, but that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and with all this suitcase around them. Um, it's really great that you took this shot with this lady who looks like a business executive. And she's also, you know, dragging a carry on very much like theirs. But they you know, obviously their situations di differ so vastly. Absolutely. Yeah, I and I love this photograph. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, I want to ask a little bit about uh, your artistic approach. Okay. So, for example, with the portrait of veteran, how do you start with creating a portrait of a veteran? Can you just give us uh, a general idea? Sure. I don't actually go into it with any conceptual ideas or thoughts behind it, because for me, it's about hearing the story first and creating the conversation. Because, again, you go back to people that have had combat, wartime, or some type of training that the military has afforded them. So you're going into a space of a person that is unfamiliar with you and you're asking them to share parts of their life. So you have to bridge a relational gap with them to get close enough. And then once you get close enough, you have to ask permission. You know, you, you can take street photos without asking for permission, which is a big topic now. But in these moments, I always want to know, is it OK in conversation that if I see that moment, can I capture something? Um, and every person has, you know, Leo, like I said, was the first one. And, you know, he asked for some change and I asked him, would he share his story with me? Um, and it's kind of been the same tone that I've set since then, um, where I allow them to open up themselves to me and then me make the photograph. So what goes into um, helping you decide how you want to portray this individual, like in terms of what composition you're gonna use? Because, you know, with these different individuals, the composition and the approach look different. Mm -hmm. Can you just share with us how sure. you decide that? Sure, Leo, that was two frames. I made two frames of Leo um, because again, I was actually on a work trip and I was crossing the street. Um, and at that moment it was, I wanted to show a little bit of the street, but then I also wanted to show what I thought I saw, um, the individual in the middle who was the Marine sniper. Um, I wanted to show him just where he was, which was outside of a, a convenience store. And he, that was his cane to the right that he walked with. Um, and he was actually waiting on uh, the VA to get him approved to have a surgery. Then he was getting ready to hopefully get approved for. Um, and he wanted bus tickets to get from point A to point B. So in that moment where we were, it was just a matter of showing what was there. Um, and in New York City, you know, 
New York is its own backdrop. So um, again, it's showing this is their luggage in a Michael's grocery store cart, mm -hmm. everything they own, they're sitting on. And uh, that was it. So I don't really go into it with a plan in mind that I want to focus on making a stage portrait as if I would be doing a headshot or something of that nature. This is just, this is raw as it gets. But what I love about how you compose these uh, images is that, you know, you, you include things that tell a story about the subject, you know, like with the luggage and, and in this case, yeah, the cane or the concrete wall, to, uh, it, they tell the story too. And that's what I love about this. And I'll just point out that above um, these three photographs of homeless veteran, there's a quote, we were trained to be invincible. And Doug quoted that for this um, gentleman who's the former sniper here in this photograph in the middle. And it really struck me, you know, that it's another story that debunks the stereotype of what a homeless person is because for him, like, it didn't seem like he felt sorry for himself because he was saying, you know, he was trained to be in hostile environment. He can fish and survive. And so for him, it's not a pitiable situation even though for us it is, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so he's trained to be invincible. He can, he can live in hostile environments yeah, and, like and, this. In context of that was too, the cove where they fished, it was interesting. We go to restaurants and we get seafood. He was fishing with what money he earned in a cove where Mahi Mahi was the prevalent fish in that cove. So in context of the cove, we're invincible because we hide in the coast. People pass us all day and they don't know that we're there. Same context as training as a sniper. So we were trained to be invincible. Now I'm invincible because I live out on the streets and I fish for my food versus in these places, you know, they're putting out uh, cups for, you know, money to be given to them. So homelessness looks different in every state mm -hmm. that I've gone to. Yeah. And Gordon Parks, actually said, uh, told the story in his memoirs about the difference too be between being poor in an urban environment and being poor in a place like Kansas. So when he started looking back to being poor, being in Kansas, he had fond memories where he was saying when he was hungry, he would go out in the field and find the apple tree where he could pick up an apple. And he said, but you know, the youths in urban environments, when they're hungry, they, they only can go to a garbage can and fish around for something. So poor is different in Kansas than in an urban area. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So do we have any questions from the audience about homeless veteran project or any comments that you'd like to share with Doug? No? All right. Well, my, you might come up with a question later. So for now, let's move on to the third series that's featured here. So it's this wall. And this one is, I believe, your latest series, correct? Yes. Um, this is the George Floyd protest series. And when did you start this? This would have started last year, early March, April, May-ish. So like around the COVID. Oh, yeah. Right, when, COVID. right when the pandemic happened. Yes. Wow. <laughs> um, all right. So. Can you choose a photograph that we can zoom in on and discuss as an example of a George Floyd protest series? Mm -hmm. You want to choose or you want me to choose? You choose. Uh, let's go with the end photograph down there. Okay, let's come over here. Oh, we're giving our cameraman a hard time, aren't we? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, uh, Doug, can you briefly describe what we're seeing? This is in downtown Junction City. Um, this protest was led by community activists. Um, people came out um, to let their voices be heard. I think this is maybe half a mile outside of the Fort Riley Gate um, in Junction City. Um, and this is, was the start of the civil unrest um, in Kansas. Uh, again, with all the things that were happening in the United States, one of the things that Myself, I noticed was everything in Kansas that I witnessed versus what I saw on TV was peaceful, peaceful protest. Mm -hmm. 
it was peaceful protest. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe, can you identify the figures who are in the front? Because I think they're, yep. they're I know, significant I know Michael figures. Turner. Michael Turner is the front individual. I don't know the rest of the individual's mm -hmm. names, um, but I know most of the faces from Junction City and some of the surrounding communities. Um, I will just say Michael Turner is um, a, the man in front, African-American, who's wearing a black shirt, and he's got his fists up, his right hand and the fists are up. And um, he was the person who started uh, the Black Lives Matter protests in Junction City, mm -hmm. right? That's correct. And what I love about this photograph is that next to him is, I think, a co-organizer. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, you identified him except it's not in the label. Oh, that's, I can't remember his yeah, name. Yeah, I there can't was, remember. There were so many names from that. And it was, again, in the photojournalism world, you know, you're, you're documenting. Um, and then unless you have to provide caption data to that, you know, you're really just capturing images. So I didn't get everybody's name yeah. in that photograph. But uh, yeah, I do remember some of the primary voices was the individual to the left under Michael Turner, uh -huh. and then this young man to the right who had his son on his shoulders. Yes, and um, that's what I love about this photograph is, so he, this guy to Michael Turner's left, he's wearing a white shirt and there's a sign uh, above his head and it says, no justice, no peace, enough is enough. And all, a lot of the names of people who had been killed by police um, recently. Mm -hmm. And there are, so, there are so many of them and that really struck me, you know, this sign. And then what struck me next about the sign is that I see the shadow a little shadow and it's obviously that of a child holding up the sign mm -hmm. and you can see that you know the the child is riding on his shoulders and you see the child's legs you know um over his uh chest and to me this is so, so remarkable that you captured this you know that this protest really brings everyone here you know to to protest injustice mm -hmm. and I know I've been to one of them and it's everybody, you know, all walks of life, yeah. African-Americans and other kinds of people. And it, it was really wonderful to see, you know, that kind of unity mm -hmm. against injustice. Absolutely. And um, I would, well, let me see if our audience has some questions or comments um, and then we'll move on to another photograph, which is my favorite. Hi, Doug. I, I assume you shoot in a digital format and the image may be colorized when it's taken. And all the images here seem to be in black and white or shades of gray. Is there a primary purpose for that? Sure. So as an artist, it's interesting that you bring that question up because during this time period, I was seeing a lot of this work in black and white, obviously in digital, you know, it's shot in color, you know, but as I, as my eye was seeing, I was seeing this work, these bodies of work in, in black and white. The Homeless Veteran Project, I particularly shot on my Leica in black and white for the reason as to not show color, to not bring attention to other things other than the context and the body of the work. I wanted to focus on the veteran and the stories. You know, sometimes, you know, when you're doing street photography, you're looking at light, you're looking at colors, things that take you away from what you're actually seeing. But in these bodies of work, I wanted the focus to be directly on the work, which actually gave it to me more of a true and telling story. So in these, in these bodies of work, I, I saw these images as I was making them in black and white. Um, but again, you know, once once you see it in color on the back of the camera or once you get into editing, um, obviously it is in color. So you have to process it to be black and white. Other questions or comments? <clears throat> uh, this is from a professor here at K-State and his name is Sri Joglakar. And Doug, this is posed to you. He's asking, what do you think is the role of beauty in documentary work? Sure. The, the role in beauty in documentary photography for me is about disruptive creativity. And for me, disruptive creativity is about, I guess for me, we all learn when disruption happens in our lives, when disruption happens in the world, when disruption happens in any facet of what you're going through, 
it it halts you it halts america it halts you know the the process in which you're on to get you to learn something so for me in all these bodies of work it was about disruption it was about disruption in and in, in segregation it was disruption in in racism it was disruption in homelessness and with all of these stories it helped change the narrative it helped create conversations again right here in manhattan kansas for people to understand that this is not a East Coast, West Coast thing. This is a worldwide thing. And the only way we learn is if we have the conversation. So through my work, the beauty in documentary photography is about creating the conversations. Any, do you have another question you wanna pose? Okay, here. <clears throat> This is from, uh, it's not clear to me who's posted it or what their affiliation is, but it's Vahib Johnny, and he's asking, I'm sure you have taken hundreds of photos. How do you select which one you would like to present and show? <laughs> that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard question. Uh, you know, one of the tools that we as photojournalists use and others use are, you know, Lightrooms, uh, photo mechanics, and, you know, you dump a thousand images into the computer and you really go through and you select you know as you select you may pick out of a thousand a couple hundred and then you narrow it down to what we call a tight edit of 30 to 40 and then within that 30 to 40 sometimes you have to sit down and you have to process and reflect what means something to you you know and as luke and i will go back and look at photographs from years ago sometimes you miss something because you're trying to put out the narrative that you want to share, but sometimes you will go back and you'll see something that catches your eye from years ago, because as we did this protest work, I mean, there's probably 5,000, 10,000 plus photos that we took last year. And as you start looking at stuff again, sometimes things have different meanings after you have. So it is a challenge, but you know, when, you, when you're going through your workflow and you're editing down, you're looking for what is the narrative or what is it that I'm trying to tell at that moment. Um, but sometimes you just have to go back and relook at work to re-inspire you. Yeah, and you might be telling a different story at that point. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, yes. So where did this start? Not like with Gordon Parks, but where's the little boy in all of this? Where did Doug come from that led him to picking up a camera and doing the great work that you're doing? My mother and father gave me my first camera at 10 years old. My father, every Christmas that I can remember, had the big VHS camcorder on his shoulder. And he would make my little sister and I sit at the top of the steps before, he, before we would come down to open up our Christmas presents. And he would say each day, he would say, this is 1997, Dougie and Bridget's Christmas. And from my earliest memories, my dad always had a film camera with him. So it was something that was ingrained in me, even though my mother wanted to push arts on me, which is what my natural instinct was. I felt growing up that for me, those weren't the careers that would have projected a life worthwhile. So fast forward, a camera has always been with me at some form or another. Um, and then with life happening, you know, highs and lows of careers, I just decided, you know what, rather than fo focus on, you know, chasing money or chasing careers, I'm gonna focus on what's natural to me. And that is telling the stories through the lens. And that's led me to right here. <clears throat> well, I just want to make an additional comment um, based on, uh, what Doug was saying, you know, that sometimes you notice, he would notice details in his photographs like a year later or a couple of years later that he didn't pay attention to before and it says something. Um, professor Sri Joklakar, who is a professor of photography here in K-State, um, talked to me about that and he called it accidental information. And so, you know, there are photographs that old photographs that you may look at again. And, you know, the, the aim of the photograph was this, but when you look at it again, you're getting information that wasn't the aim of the, the, the lens at that time to capture, but they are really valuable information. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. and, and I, I think that's fascinating about photography. And um, I co-curated the Gordon Parks exhibition next door and, and one of the things that I've learned, you know, with um, Gordon Parks' photography is that 
he would approach his photographs differently like years later so say he did a series that's for a life magazine or a particular story but then you know he would put together books with his photographs and he would he would frame them differently or crop them differently or or print them in black and white even though the negative was in color and he was emphasizing different stories and 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 different messages you know so he was thinking about them differently and i think now that Doug is saying that, you know, it's something that photographers do. Yeah, and, and, and uh, Gordon Parks is a master on that, like recycling and recontextualizing his photographs. So I want to um, talk a bit about one of my favorites in the series, George Floyd Protests. And there's a quote above um, this wall, and it says, the change we need starts with us. And... I think this photograph um, that is called, titled, Will the Hate End, really uh, captures that sentiment. And I'll just briefly describe this. So we have a young boy who's maybe 13, right? African-American boy and, behind, and you know, next to him are two little girls. Um, looks like there's an adult behind him holding a, holding a cell phone and he's holding up this sign and it says, stop the hate. And you had a great story about this, Doug, when you were telling me how you got this. Can you tell that to the audience? Sure. Uh, this image uh, was one of the ones that the editor from Time Magazine called me and told me that he wanted to run it in Time Magazine, which ultimately ran at the uh, end of the year Time Magazine. Uh, top photos uh, made the, not the cover, but the front page. Um, and within this photograph, you know, Again, all of this is happening. Um, you're photographing, you're making images. And as photographers, I was with my colleagues and we were running around out there trying to document and cover, you know, what we thought, you know, the protest was trying to tell the community. Um, and after exhaustion, I said, you know, I'm gonna go set up on the opposite side of where my colleagues were. And, you know, I, I stood in the middle of the sidewalk and as people were walking to my left and to my right, you know, I made the image um, and within this image, this was not the image that one of the questions was asked, was this one of the ones that I selected? Uh, at the time it was not, um, but as I was, my attention was brought back to it, the meaning of what this protest was about, um, the racism, the hate um, that America is seeing, the black African-American community is seeing, it was powerful, it was impactful. Um, so you have these, four young juveniles with their mother, you know, community citizens, you've got the flags waving in the background, um, and, and kids at this youngest age who are out at, I think, Riley, which is the far left girl, seven years old at the time, and her older brother, 13, who are protesting in the United States, uh, things that come with the meaning behind what happened to George Floyd. Um, so again, the image now means a heck of a lot more um, now than when I made it because it has such powerful meaning. Yeah, to me, this is both triumphant and also bittersweet because it's triumphant that you have these young people who are coming out and you know fighting for justice and for their civil rights. But on the other hand, it makes me sad that they felt compelled to do it. You know, so we adults have to do better. That's why the change we need starts with us. That's right. right, Doug? Yep, absolutely, you know. <clears throat> um, so, Linda is gesturing. Is there a question? Yes, yes, a couple of interesting questions have come in. One from Jean Farmer to Doug. Did your work creating the George Floyd protest photographs affect you in any unexpected ways? Yes, Miss Farmer is a childhood neighbor that lives in the parent, my parents' community, our neighborhood, and she went to Ohio University and she's got a journalism background for context. Um, does it mean anything to me and how did it impact me? Yes, because as an African-American male, um, I've been pulled over, I've been uh, stopped, talked to. Um, I've got similar stories that I've shared that, you know, for me as an African-American male, you know, 
being investigated and looked at based upon the color of my skin is a is a fear factor for me you know having served in law enforcement and military it's scary when you're on the other side you know i'm a father i want to go home to my kids um, and i hope that uh what people are feeling on on the on the blue side uh, doesn't project into you know me losing my life so again i felt the need as an african-american photojournalist to be able to share uh, my narrative with my work Yes, and um, also Jean Farmer asked if not being a Kansan gave you a special perspective in doing the Yuma Street project. Yeah, I was able to I was able to photograph it with uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for with a different set of eyes. You know, a lot of people have said you know I grew up in Kansas and I didn't even know the history. Of, of Yuma Street, you know, so for me, I went into it with a mindset that I was able to absorb, you know, I have I had no connection to the community, I had no connection to Kansas, other than, you know, being a resident um, and, and wanting to learn more about why the negative connotation of living on South Manhattan was such a bad thing. Um, so as I learned, I learned that, you know, for me, Yuma Street was a lot of history. Uh, Mr. Baker uh, educated me with informing me of places on Yuma Street that had historical context to the people, the places where the current Douglas Center sat, you know, and, and where people used to reside and communicate or where they used to reside and have community, you know, now it looks a lot different, but there was a story behind it. So to have that context, I was able to absorb and make that through photography. There's one more question here, but I don't know, do you have time? This is from Professor Katie Carlin from English, who remarked that you presented for the Young Writers Workshop mm -hmm. last summer. She says, you mentioned that taking street photos without permission is a big topic of discussion now. You take a lot of time to get to know your subjects. Are you ethically opposed to taking photos without permission? Do you feel that the photos are not as rich if you don't hear the subject's stories beforehand? Yeah, so, you know, in street photography, you know, you go to, you go to New York and it's, it's photographing colors, it's photographing movement, it's photographing things that you see that capture your eye. You know, to me, there's not a permission that needs to be asked in that because it's about the rhythm of the streets. You know, I'm not from New York. You lived in New York, Luke lived in New York, and you understand the flow of things. You understand the flow of subways and streets and patterns, the avenues. Um, and when you go up there, I mean, if you had to ask permission, you'd be out there days and hours and weeks. So it's a completely different type of photography. But when you photograph a person and a narrative and a story, you know, in order just to take an image and put it on social media or to share it on your website, to me, to give the narrative to somebody else, you should ask for permission to make a photograph to tell with a story. Um, and then obviously in these, these were portraits of individuals. This was live in the action. This was live in the action. Um, talking to Mr. Um, Mr. Lazone Gray's, talking to Ms. Cole, those were portraits, but they were portraits within conversation and context. So I think it's a completely different thing. There's people that are kind of in the photo world that are talking about that. Um, but within the work that I do, I always give the people respect to allow them to share their stories and ask for permission. So within what I do. And I just also want to say, you know, that when you are not native Kansan and you come in, I think that you really regarded you must the Yuma Street stories and history uh, with fresh eyes because you didn't bring um, prejudice that maybe mm -hmm. you would have inherited if you're a native Kansan or sure. you know longtime resident of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the beauty of of people who come in with fresh eyes. Um, it made me, you know, when you're telling me about the Yuma Street project, maybe question like, why is Yuma Street considered the ghetto? You know, and frankly, I mean, I've been to Yuma Street. I used to take Zumba classes in Douglas Center and there was nothing there that made me feel like it was a ghetto. So why? And, you know, learning from you, it's a historic African-American neighborhood. 
-hmm. in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. yep. So it, I, I think that it, um, you know, shows that the underlying prejudice there is, it's the, you know. It's, it's the prejudices, but it's also the misinformed and the misinformation and the lack of education. Mm -hmm. So when people don't know something, they have preconceived notions to what they think. Yeah. So until you can actually step foot into somebody's backyard, I learned that the people that lived over there, they looked like you and they looked like me. It was the Asian community, it was the Latino community, it was the African American community. So people that necessarily did not step foot because of stories that were passed down to them, I have hopefully put that onto paper and into print so that you can see that this is a beautiful community. This is historic, you know, a, a, a nature that now you can experience this and have an understanding that, you know, it may be a lower income side of town or the lower income side of the community. Um, but at the same time, these are people with beautiful stories and you'd never know that if it wasn't for the photographs. Yes, and that's the power of visual <laughs> art, I think. You know, that um, they tell stories visually in a different way, make you notice things. Like, for example, like we were talking about that um, homeless veteran uh, image, you know, husband and wife waiting for temporary housing, you know, and, and the idea that, you know, their belongings behind them just because it's in a shopping cart. Some people assume they're sitting with trash when that's not the case, right? But if you look closely, then you realize that you're, assumption is wrong. And I think that's the beauty of uh, visual art and photography is that, you know, it makes you take a second look and readjust what your um, initial assumption was. Do we have another question from the audience? Yeah, and I think actually I was, well, is there any comment or, or question from our audience here in the gallery? Yes. I'm curious, they always tell you when you're just taking snapshots to make sure you have the sun behind you, but some of your most powerful images are taken with the sun behind the subjects. This particular delightful picture of the family over here and the picture that was chosen by Time Magazine. Now, these I can see, maybe it's just where you happen to be when the subjects came before you, but I wonder, do you actually compose pictures sometimes deliberately um, contravening the conventions? Yeah, so in, in photography, light is light is what makes your photograph. Um, you're always paying attention to it. Uh, as a photographer, you're constantly looking for it. Obviously, in, in the in the in the in the streets in a protest, you're just making the images how you can make the images. You're constantly making adjustments in your head for calculations to the camera, your exposures. Um, but then again, when you're in the home of Mr. Gulliford, you know, you have to adjust for the light within the home. Um, the Yuma Street series, it was about taking the photo in that moment. You know, the pandemic was happening. This was a father that was laid off and he was with his, his three daughters um, and he was literally on the street. So I went and talked to him and the light just happened to be at his back. So in these moments, you know, I was not necessarily looking at light as if I would a landscape photograph. It's more about capturing what I see at that point in time. <clears throat> I want to make a comment on that because it's kind of fascinating. As I've been looking through Doug's work a lot and he'd show me an edit in color and I'm just like, oh man, I don't know if that really works. And, but he's like, no man, I'm, I'm seeing in black and white. And then he'll change that. And it just instantly shifts that picture. And it's, it's this difference of like how he's looking at that light if he's shooting in black and white it might necessarily not reveal itself that way in color, but then in black and white. And so the, like, there's this method that's, I think, maybe subconscious, particularly in your mind as you're shooting mm -hmm. and how you're using light. That's really fascinating. Yeah. That opened up my eyes to how I shoot and how I photograph different light as well. So, yeah. I remember actually asking Doug this question in one of our conversations of why do you like black and white shoot, you know, photography? And you told me that because with black and white and the variations in black to gray to white, um, you can bring out different kinds of textures within the photograph. And that's, okay, sure that <laughs> I remember that very okay. vividly because yeah. it just was su such a striking description. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious. 
my first time with the camera in class. So I'm kind of blown away how um, in focus and in perspectives all of these are when it looks like, especially in the protest, you're probably walking with them or something. How on earth do you do that? <laughs> Again, that, that comes with that comes with practice, um, you know, and it under, comes with the cameras. You know, Luke shoots with a, a manual focus camera, so it, it's a challenge. You know, like it requires you to constantly be adjusting for focus and also understanding where your exposure is. Uh, some of the digital cameras allow for adjustments of your focus points. So again, as you're photographing, you know, what people see is that one image, you know, this is constant movement. So you're constantly looking for what is my focus point? What am I trying to show in this frame? You know, when I capture this frame, you know, what do I see versus what will other people see? What can I tell within this frame? Um, whether that's a 35 millimeter, 70 to, 70 to 200, 28, whatever it is, you know, when you capture what's in that frame, you know, you want to make sure what's in focus allows you to tell that story or depict whatever you're trying to get across. Uh, do we have other questions? Okay, I don't want to have you guys standing for an hour, so I'm going to wrap it up here, but Doug will stick around. Um, we're going to proceed to the auditorium. And if you want to talk to Doug, you know, we'll, we'll be in that area to talk informally. But I want to wrap up um, by just pointing out that Mr. Gulliford is right here with us. So Mr. Gulliford is the subject of that photograph, A Beautiful Marriage, which I love. <laughs> and <laughs> so thank you for being here. So um, Doug's uh, exhibition is the partner exhibition to the one next door, which is Gordon Park's Homeward to the Prairie I Come. So I encourage you to also go walk around there and check it out. Um, you know, Gordon Park's was from a generation before, and his work has inspired a lot of contemporary artists and photographers, I think, including Doug, sure. dare I say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I, I, Doug's um, exhibition shows how those issues are still really um, urgent. And also that Gordon Park, what Gordon Parks did you know, continues in spirit through further innovations by artists like Doug. Thanks everyone for coming. So everyone, let's move to um, the auditorium down the hall, outside the auditorium.